Hi, I'm Ed Sperling. I'm the Editor-in-Chief of Semiconductor Engineering. I'm over a synopsis with Thomas Anderson. We're going to talk today about the impact of AI on chip design. Thomas, we've been hearing about AI coming into chip design for a long time. What's changed? Why is it, why is it so important now? And what's, what are you seeing in terms of results? Yeah, it's a very good question. I think there's, there's multiple reasons. Number one, I would say we've reached an inflection point when it comes to uh, um, getting performance out of chips. We have node scaling that's waning. It's harder and harder to get performance out of chips today. At the same time, complexity is rising. And because of the rise in complexity, that's a productivity aspect. Chips take longer to get out the door. You need more people. And that's essentially asking for some type of automation. And we've seen AI as uh, an instrument in many other areas. We, we, I would argue it can do simple things today. You can you know, make a reservation. You can ask a question that will give you an answer of whatever it has learned on the internet. The question is, chip design, of course, is a little bit different. It's not like driving a car. Everybody can drive a car. Can everybody design a chip? No, of course not. So there's a creative process. And there's also parts of the chip design where AI definitely can help. Do engineers take natural weight to this? I would say there's resistance because engineers specifically, first of all, they have a lot of knowledge. We call this tribal knowledge that they've acquired over many years. And I, I, I would say compared to, to the normal person, engineer is, is more questioning things. Is it really possible that AI can do a better job than me? Or am I being replaced? So there, there is a resistance. There's also, of course, a lot of interest. Uh, so I would say there's, there's two camps. There's the camp of people who say, wow, this makes me better. This makes me more productive. I can, I can get better PPA for my chips and I can do them faster. And then there's the, the people that are skeptical. And I think that's, you know, nature. Let's take a closer look. Absolutely. Thomas, what are we looking at? So I, I've chosen as an example the process of physical design. Of course, in chip design, there's, there's many things, verification, test, physical design, sign-off, manufacturing, lithography. Um, I've taken the example of the physical design partially because it's a very uh, large part of the process. So physical design means I have an incoming RTL, I've created a netlist out of it, and now I need to place, route, and connect essentially all the millions of cells on this chip. Um, we have, of course, EDA automation tools, such as Fusion Compiler, where you take this design and you come up with um, an implementation of the design. Um, at the same time, though, when you look at the overall workflow, there is many input choices that a user has to make that go beyond the actual tool. Things like, for example, process choices, things like metal stack, metal thickness, and things that have impact on my PPA. Similarly, library choices. There's you can have libraries with thousands of cells that might be good for power, that might be good for timing. Which library cell do I choose for which type of application? Then I have lots of design choices to make. And of course, also flow choices in terms of how do I position my steps in my implementation flow. And the way this works today is essentially there is a human. You can see I'm a great drawer here. So there's a human sitting here that um, essentially is running this process over and over again and is varying all these inputs. And he's essentially running experiments. And these experiments take a long time. They could take a day to run. You take an input and you see, OK, so what type of power do I get if I try this? What type of result do I get if I change my library cells? So that's a, essentially a, a long iterative loop where you go through this entire workflow. And today, that's done by a human. So that's, to me, when we thought about this, we felt this is a great application for AI. You've done a good job describing the problem here. So what does AI actually do here? What's the solution? Very, very good, good question. So think about it. In the EDA space, unlike in many other areas, we don't have unlimited data. So it's not like we have millions of chips I could train a system on and say, all right, so you've seen this type of chip before. Tell me what to do. Um, similarly, the design data is constantly changing. It's not that I'm doing the same chip over and over again. My technology nodes, all these inputs are constantly changing. Like every 18 months, we have a new process node which will change things. So this is very different from the world out there. If, say I'm, I'm uh, doing a self-driving car application where the, the rules of the road may be changing, but very, very slowly. So um, what we have decided to do is here to use what we call reinforcement learning, which is a technique that has been used, for example, to... Uh, uh, solve problems like um, playing games like chess or Go. 
Um, and here you can really think of this as playing the game of chip design. So instead of a human running all these experiments, varying these inputs, and then observing what happens, we essentially have a system, a system that runs these experiments, uh, gets trained over time, see how the design behaves to all these inputs, and learns the behavior of the design, and will tell you exactly what type of trade-offs you can make between your power performance area or whatever the metrics you're trying to optimize. And so this is something that you can come into midway in a design too, right? Because you've already got the tools, you've already experimented with it, you understand how the data will be manipulated. You can start at the very beginning, or you can come in midway or do it at the end. Ideally, of course, you start in the beginning because these are oftentimes sequential processes. Like you may, your process parameters is something that you explore first. We call this design technology co-optimization. Uh, you can start there, you can optimize that part. Then, of course, you can optimize many other things along the way, library like design choices. You can do this all the way at the beginning, and there you make, I would say, more architectural type choices, or you can bring it in towards the end where you, you essentially fine tune your, your um, uh, workflow. But with reinforcement learning, unlike a huge database where you've got massive amounts of data and, and you're going to put weights across that, what you're doing here is saying, okay, as a company or as a design house, we understand exactly what we're developing. We've already done some of this before. Here's what works best for us, and we've now tuned it, right? That's right, and this is something before AI that happened over and over again, right? The interesting thing to note is that this knowledge of this has worked in the past on my previous chip, where's that knowledge? It's in this guy's head, and not just one guy. There's actually multiple people. So this tribal knowledge is distributed among multiple people. So what happens when those people move on to a different company? Or what happens if they're in different locations, they don't even talk to each other? You might find somebody at a water cooler and you tell you, hey, I tried this, and you should try this type of thing, and it will give you better power. Um, but this is all in people's heads. Now, the beauty of the system is that not only can it optimize this process, it learns the behavior of the design and creates statistical models. So therefore, the next time when I do my next version of design, an evolution, which may be different, but also a lot of reuse, I can start with all this knowledge. And instead of in people's heads, it's now in an ML database that I can use and essentially refine this. How does this actually work? How do you get a better result? Remember, I, I talked about playing the game of chip design. I'm going to go back a little bit to how things like AlphaGo were developed. So when you look at, for example, the game of chess, right? Um, it has, I think, a 10 to the power of 123 combinations of different choices I can play out. Um, and one way to do this is, of course, brute force. You have an algorithm that you know calculates all possible choices. And at some point, if you have enough of a depth that you pre-calculate, you can beat a human. Now, everybody knows a human doesn't work that way. No, no human chess player sits there and, and thinks about all the combinations. I mean, a bad chess player maybe would, but a good one wouldn't, right? He has a strategy and he knows what to do. Um, so similarly, um, when AlphaGo was developed, they used reinforcement learning essentially not to brute force, explore this whole space, but essentially learn and have this notion of what we call delayed reward, meaning I can make a choice at a certain point that looks suboptimal, but in the end, it's gonna give me the best possible result. And we use the exact same technique here. So in the chip world, very often, you optimize um, timing versus power. So, for the purpose of this experiment, um, the best result is here, meaning like my total negative flag would be close to zero and I want to minimize my power. Um, again, a human in this space, he would vary many different inputs and he would come up you know, with, with a few examples of I found this, I found this space. Um, and let's say for example, in this particular case, this is the best possible thing that a human was able to come up with. Now the machine or our reinforcement learning algorithm it takes many different experiments and it learns from all these different results. Um, it may start off, you know, finding first some dots up here that are not so good, that have poor, poor power or some results here, good power but bad timing. Eventually though, it will come up with points, um, very much like a banana curve actually. It will come up with points here and start refining this. Now keep in mind, since I'm optimizing essentially a complex workflow, 
there is no traditional optimization techniques that work because there isn't a convergent surface there that I can optimize for. Instead, the way this works is essentially you take sample points and where goodness lies, you keep refining it and where bad things lie, like say here the results are not so good, you start abandoning them. And that's where you can essentially search a large search space and find the, the pockets where goodness lies. And to be honest with you, it's not very surprising that you can beat a human in this type of technology because you're just more powerful. You can run many experiments and pass. You can learn from behavior, which is not something that I would argue the human would be very good at, naturally. There's a lot of use models here that, are, that can be applied to this, though, too, right? Absolutely. In fact, um, you can think of it um, as you, you can optimize just the general workflow for power performance area, but you can make architectural decisions. You can, for example, use it for your clock tree. I can have different implementations of a clock tree. I can do different implementations of a power network. We have people use it for what they call PVT optimization, looking at the trade-off curve between power, voltage, temperature. Um, you can use it for DTCO, design technology co-optimization. Essentially, think of it as every time you have a choice to make, an uh, implementation choice, an architectural choice, or a choice in terms of a flow or a, a setting, um, you can ask the system, tell me what's the best possible result you can find. So you can argue the applications are endless. If you can define a choice that has an impact on the output, I can optimize for your output that you, you're looking for. So when you think about AI, AI results will always come up as a distribution. This is the ones that you're saying are the optimal ones for whatever you're trying to do, right? Well, the, the notion of optimality is a tough one, but uh, it is very hard to prove where the optimal result lies, especially when it's a very, very large space. But of course, in our experiments, we are always able to beat what a human was able to do. We have not a single result where we're not able to get a better result. What do you need in terms of resources that people don't have necessarily in-house? That's a very good question. So, of course, there's a compute requirement. So many of these dots that you see are essentially parallel experiments that the system runs because it needs to first learn how this design behaves. So for that reason, a very good application is to use it on the cloud um, where you have this compute available. Now, keep in mind... Um, I had talked about how over time you learn the behavior of the design. So that's the beauty of this. Remember I said there's tribal knowledge in people's heads and now it's an, essentially an ML database that knows how this design behaves. So the beauty is that as you go through the design process, your compute requirements will go down because you keep learning and you keep refining the result. And when you go to the next chip, again, you don't start from scratch. You don't say like, oh, I've never seen this design before. Instead, you say, ah, this is similar to the other design. So I start my training based on the previous design, and that really reduces my compute requirements. Well, this Isn't this almost like the inferencing side to training? Yes, it, it, it is, except the, the difference is since the design will always be somewhat changing, there's a there's part of it is inferencing, but a part of it is continuous optimization and exploration to adjust to the new data. Where else can this go? What, what, what else can this be expanded to? That's a very, very good point that you're making. So I talked about the physical implementation space. And why did we choose physical implementation as one of the first applications? It's because there's a lot of value. Everybody wants the best possible performance. And it's also uh, a part of the process that takes a long time and lots of resources. Um, in general, though, this type of technology is applicable to many different areas. For example, when you do your ATPG test uh, pattern uh, creation, or for example, when you come up with the verification patterns in order to reach uh, best possible coverage, or many other areas. Um, lithography, manufacturing, where you optimize your mask models. Even uh, in the analog circuit optimization, where you try to move a design from one node to another, you move the schematic over and then optimize the circuit. There is great applications of this type of technology. And in fact, uh, we've recently announced Synopsis.ai. And with that, multiple applications that expand this from the digital implementation space, which is covered by DSO, uh, to the test space, so we have TSO and the verification space with, with VSO, and we have many other upcoming technologies uh, that are coming later this year. You've got a lot of moving pieces there, though, right? Because you, you now have data that's being created at multiple stages, potentially with AI, and it's all in motion because it may change from one to the next. The challenge will be understanding how that data gets integrated with other pieces of it, right? Yeah, totally. I mean, if you think about it, ultimately, 
ultimate thing is that you essentially have what we call pervasive AI, which goes acro across the entire stack of, of EDA tools. An example would be, to me, in the implementation space, I also implement my DFT. So I can optimize DFT separately, but of course here, there's a dependency on things. I can optimize it such that my DFT implementation not just optimizes, say, the wire length for that, but also has an impact on my design implementation. And similarly, there's connections between verification, the RTL creation, the implementation, the PPA you make. And there's, for example, connections with physical sign-up and manufacturing lithography where models can be shared and the optimization that you do go across the entire flow rather than just looking at one compartmentalized uh, solution of the flow. How do you see this playing out over the next five, 10 years? Well, the way I see this is, I talked about the potential that it has to improve your PPA, your results, your QR, but also improve the productivity. In my opinion, companies, um, they want to be on the leading edge and they want to be competitive. They have no choice but to adopt this type of technology um, and use it essentially pervasively across their entire EDA stack. Um, also, um, I think this solves, of course, a part of the problem. There's also another part of, I would say, maybe human creativity, which is honestly difficult at this moment to address. So we have things like chat GPT, where I would argue it does, it's not really creative. It still just learns you know, all the information that's out there and gives you an answer. I think there will ultimately be applications even in the chip design flow but again, um, we will have to be very careful because we have to make sure that, for example, let's say you have a system that creates um, a very log, as an example. We have to make sure that this is verifiable, it actually gives you good QR. Um, so the quality aspect of things uh, need to be solved when you integrate generative AI solutions, for example, with uh, you know, RL optimization solutions such as the ones we've, we've discussed today. Thomas Anderson, thanks for a really interesting discussion. Absolutely. Thank you very much.